Some of the things that I feel need to change in our society are tangible things like trains or city planning, but others are philosophical ideas. When I studied philosophy at university, the most important thing that I learned was that the philosophical underpinnings of our public policies are incredibly important and, at the same time, poorly understood. One of these underpinnings that is particularly dangerous is the idea of personal responsibility. What I mean by personal responsibility is the idea that we as individuals are completely responsible for our actions and their consequences. This doctrine is very dangerous when taken to extremes. My next podcast will deal with the insurance industry, and in it I'm going to talk about the ways our society views the consequences of our actions. But in this episode, I'm going to focus on the ways the doctrine of personal responsibility affects how we think about decision making. Democratic society is based on the premise that we are all free to choose. Free will is the basis of voting, and I've come to believe that it is the idea of free will that has so elevated the doctrine of personal responsibility. The argument runs, if we're free to choose, then shouldn't the consequences of our choices be our responsibility? But are we really free to choose? Sociologists have discovered that we make most of our decisions without thinking. Most decisions are based on instinct or habit or by applying what are essentially decision-making formulas, called heuristics, that operate without our understanding. That what is popular is also good is one such heuristic. It's a formula that is usually correct. For instance, covering your mouth when you sneeze is a good idea and it's also incredibly popular. Proper manners are really nothing more than a formal structure of usually beneficial habits which grew so popular that it became taboo to ignore them. Popular equals good is a very powerful formula. If you doubt that, ask yourself how many times you've just gone along with what everyone else was doing without even thinking about it. In most cases, this formula benefits us, but it can also be used to manipulate us. Recognizing that we can be manipulated is the first step to accepting that we aren't always free to make decisions. One of the decisions we make most often is what to buy. Advertising affects these decisions in powerful and destructive ways. That advertising is effective isn't up for debate. If it weren't effective, corporations wouldn't spend money on it. What exactly is the goal of an advertising campaign? Some will tell you that the goal is to make the public aware of a new product, and in some cases this is true. But then why does Coca-Cola still advertise? It's unreasonable to argue that anyone in North America hasn't heard of Coke. The only conclusion is that advertisers are trying to convince us to buy their products or services. In some ways, there is nothing wrong with that, but the advertisers don't stop at arguing the merits of their products. They go further. They manipulate us. To the media savvy among you, this idea is nothing new. I spoke before about the formula of popularity equaling good. That's exactly why Coke still advertises. Just seeing their product name everywhere makes us assume that the product is popular. It's called branding, and it's a huge part of advertising. Manipulation in advertising goes much further than this. In North America, we're facing an obesity epidemic. The personal responsibility camp will tell you that it is all the individual's fault if they get fat eating fast food. Certainly, some of the blame does fall on them, but arguing that they are solely at fault is where the idea of personal responsibility becomes truly insidious. It is the fault of the obese, but it isn't just their fault. There's plenty of fault to go around. I'm going to talk about who else shares the blame in future episodes, but for today, I'll focus on advertisers. One of the things advertising has successfully done to our society is to tear away the self-esteem of a huge portion of our population. Again, I don't think it's an evil conspiracy. It's just the natural result of the form of advertising. An advertiser's goal is to convince you that their product will solve your problem, whatever your problem is, even if you don't have one. Thirsty? Try a Coke. Hungry? Have a Big Mac. Can't jump as high as your buddies? take home a pair of Air Jordans. With this in mind, you'll understand how it is to the advertiser's advantage to invent problems in your life and to tell you how much you need to improve. The fashion industry is the classic example. If you haven't seen the video of a woman transforming into a model, then you should watch it. There's a link on my channel page. The video is called How to Transform an Ordinary Woman into a Top Model. Women and men are told exactly what they should look like, and the standards that have been set are unhealthy and unreasonable. Unable to meet these standards, our self-esteem falls. Media is obsessed with the beautiful and rich, and we understand media as a mirror on our culture. But we aren't all rich, although we are all beautiful. The disconnect between how we believe we should be and how we are reinforces our low self-esteem. Low self-esteem is key to most advertising campaigns, but it's also key to nearly all eating disorders, and obesity is an eating disorder. For this and other reasons, I feel that advertising needs to be curtailed. Briefly, the other reasons include the environmental cost of print advertising, the detrimental effect on print journalism of having to rely on advertising, not subscriptions, the general waste and needlessness of consumerist culture, which is something I'll speak about a number of times, 
the invasion of privacy that advertising carries with it, and the idea that every lie weakens every truth. The arguments against curtailing advertising are quite strong, and the strongest of them is that advertisers have the freedom of speech. Our culture labors under the myth that freedom of speech is absolute. It's not. Shouting fire in a crowded theater is the classic example of what are called time, place, and manner restrictions. Whenever the law restricts the freedom of speech, it does so to protect other rights. You can't utter death threats because we all have the right to feel secure in our person. I believe that advertisers are restricting the freedom of thought of society at large by using highly manipulative techniques to convince us to buy their products, and I believe that the freedom of thought of everyone outweighs the freedom of speech of a few. This is where I come to loggerheads with the doctrine of personal responsibility. Personal responsibility claims that we can't be manipulated, and if we are, it's our fault. For evidence that we can be manipulated, read this book by Robert Caidini, or speak to anyone who has ever been a member of a cult. In terms of getting conned, being our fault, that's called blaming the victim, which is like saying if a girl is raped she had it coming for dressing a certain way or not carrying mace. All this might seem relatively benign to some of you when looking at products, but when viewed in terms of political campaigns this issue looks downright evil. The personal responsibility solution to advertising is media awareness campaigns. I find the idea of government-funded media awareness campaigns laughable. Clearly, the government feels that advertising is doing us harm, and their solution is to warn us and give us advice on how to deal with it. That's like a cop coming to your door when an axe murderer is trying to kill you, and suggesting that you duck and offering you a pamphlet on how to avoid being attacked in the future. What would the policy I'm talking about look like? First, outlaw unsolicited print advertising. This will hurt the postal service, but don't worry, I've got a plan. Second, disallow advertising in newspapers and magazines outside of the classified sections. Currently, magazines have to balance their content with their ads just to compete. Taking ads out of print journalism would have the added advantage of raising the quality of investigative reporting and in-depth analysis, as the competition would now be for the best content to ensure a high number of subscribers. I admit this means a number of magazines and advertisers would go out of business, but I believe the market is oversaturated and inefficient. I'll discuss what we do for the people who lose their jobs when I discuss shortening the work week. Third, we limit billboard and poster advertising to community events and local fundraisers. Fourth, we need to deal with TV and radio. This one is tricky, but not as tricky as it seems. We can all recognize that stations like HBO create higher quality programming, and this is a good thing. Businesses like iTunes are now selling television shows directly to the viewer commercial free and as I understand it, the production companies make more money per viewer selling the shows directly than telecasting them. We need to encourage the system as much as we can. Networks will have to convert to one of these pay structures to survive, and chances are they'll also have to improve their content. I'm sure you'll say that if we're paying for content, either on our computer or on our cable bill, people will be more selective about what they watch on TV. I say good. Our culture watches too much TV. The only people who think we don't watch enough are people in advertising and television. Also, if we are now paying for content, I believe that we will be more likely to attend live theater and sporting events. Technology is quickly making radio obsolete. Digital music and free podcasts will soon completely replace radio. NPR and the CBC can provide weather, traffic, news, and emergency broadcasts without relying on advertisers, and any nonprofit group who wishes to transmit will be free to do so, as I suspect licensing fees will draw precipitously when there is no money to be made from advertising. Direct advertising campaigns where people are paid to walk down the street talking about how much they like a product are unethical and should be disallowed. Essentially, the only advertising that should be allowed is advertising that is being sought out by the consumer. By this, I mean the yellow pages, ordered catalogs, and product displays. The rule I have in mind is that advertising should seek to aid the consumer to solve their legitimate needs or wants with a particular product, not convince them that they need or want it in the first place. To do this, ads for a business should be limited to describing their hours, their location, what services they provide, and what products they carry. Ads for products should be limited to a description of their function, method of production, and their relative merits compared to competing goods. All claims would need to be verified by an independent quality board. I'll discuss the other advantages of such a board in a later podcast. Faced with such stark advertising, consumers would come to rely on product reviews and unbiased research when making purchasing decisions, which is a good thing. I'll also later discuss what a massive decrease in consumption would mean and what political advertising should look like. I know my ideas aren't comprehensive or perfect. Don't shoot me down. Make suggestions. My name is Colin Jones, and I want things to get better.